أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية مولانا علي بن أبي طالب صلوات ثم الصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على النبي الأمي المكي المدني سيدنا ومولانا ومولى الثقلين بالقاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين الغر الميامين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا ولعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم من حين عداوتهم إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله الحكيم في كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فسبح بحمد ربك وكن من الساجدين آمنا بالله وصدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات Respected elders, dear brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh عظم الله أجورنا وأجوركم بمسابنا بيد عبد الله الحسين وأولاده وأصحابه وعوانه. May Allah amplify in your reward in grief of the master of the martyrs, Sayyid al-Shuhada. And I would like to offer my condolences to all of you and our collective condolences. On this sad occasion of the martyrdom of our fourth holy Imam, Ali ibn al Hussein Zain al Abideen, to the Imam of our time, Imam al Hujjah, who is indeed sitting at this moment in Baqir. By the grave, there, there is no light, where there is no visitor remembering his grandfather, Ali ibn al Hussein. It is very hard to imagine a young man during his early 20s is being witness of the most difficult circumstances of someone's life, being witness of massacre or killing of his own father, his family members, and being witness of taking his family as captives. And he himself is not only witness, but was kept in chains and dragged towards the streets of Kufa and Damascus, Sham. But with all this, this man, this young man, keeps himself strong on the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and becomes the role model for the youth until the day of judgment. The story of Sayyidus Sajideen is a very unique source of inspiration for our youth, for all of us, especially our youth, how we can keep our willpower strong. Who can imagine the situation in which he was when he was only 22 or 23 years old? Imagine. Nowadays, 
a little bit of difficulty in our lives sometimes make us depressed. We have a great number of young children or young men who are thinking of suicide to this extent that they are so much disappointed of this world on very few things, on very minor things. When they are not successful, maybe in their school, they were unable to acquire good grades, maybe they were unable to find a suitable match for them to get married, or in their life, in very ordinary situations, people, they lose hope. Imam Sayyidu Sajjad, for whole humanity, especially the followers and the lovers of Sayyidu Sajideen, he is a role model that not only he loses his hope, but becomes a person who is remembered until the day of judgment with the name or the title of Sayyidus Sajideen. Do you know the meaning of Sayyidus Sajideen? Sajid means one who prostrate, who surrenders himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who puts his forehead to honor Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Sayyidus Sajjad becomes Sayyidus Sajideen, the leader, the ornament of the prostrators. And Zainul Abideen, the ornament or the beauty of the worshippers. This is the strong character of Sayyidus Sajideen. For us, being sitting here and remembering Sayyidus Sajideen, there are many lessons which we can learn through the life of Imam Ali ibn al Hussein. So inshallah tonight with this introduction, I would like to draw your attentions towards some of the unique aspects of this holy imam. Because most of you might have heard about him, but majority or the most of the times when his personality is mentioned, the aspect of his life which is discussed or which is having the time from the first day or the ninth day of Karbala until they are returning back to Medina. A very small, very small time duration, very small, very little duration in which Sayyidu Sajideen was having these atrocities and especially on the day of Ashura when it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wisdom that he was put in the state of unconsciousness. But does it mean that we should not have any image beside the image of a fatigue or a sick person? No. There is a life of 23 years before that time and there is a life of 33 to 30 or 34 years after the day of Ashura, which Imam Sayyidah Sajjad lived. And in fact, in fact, as you just have heard Brother Adnan very eloquently, he explained, if we talk about the life of Sayyid Sajjad before Karbala, because on the day of Ashura, officially he was appointed to the office of Imamate. He was not Imam because it's the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. An Imam is not declared to hold the office of Imamate until the previous Imam is there. So during the time of, although we have hadith, of Holy Prophet Ahmad Mustafa Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It says Al Hasan wa Al Hussein Imama Qama wa Qaada. Both are Imams, but when the time of Imam Hasan's Imamat is there, Imam Hussein is not holding officially the office of Imamat. But Sayyid Sajjad, even at his young age, when he was a child. He used to give fatwa. People that would come and would ask him their questions, although his father and uncle was there too. So it shows the benevolence. It shows the extreme knowledge which he used to possess. But during the day of Ashura, so I'm not going to talk about his life before the day of Ashura. Neither I'm going to talk about the life which was during the time of Ashura and until the return of the captives to Medina. I would like to draw your attentions towards the lifespan which he has lived after his arrival in Medina until his martyrdom. So it is impossible to describe his one aspect of life, but I would like to 
list few of the aspects and would invite you to research more in those aspects. Because you will be amazed in the short life of 33 years when a young man is victim of extreme atrocities and the most difficult scenario when he returns back to Medina. The life was not easy. The ruler after Yazid, in fact, during his time, Yazid was there. Yazid did not die during his time of imamate because he was appointed as imam on the day of Ashura. So the early time of his imamate, Yazid was the caliph. Yazid was the ruler. So his atrocities were there. And after that, his son, and after that, Abdul Malik bin Marwan. So early Umayyad time, during the time of Imam Sayyid al-Sajjad, he was kept in house arrest. He was not allowed to deal with people. He was not allowed to meet with people. He was not allowed to go to masjid and deliver sermons. So after this all time, even he was so forced by them to stay inside the house, he did not forget his responsibility being the imam or the leader of the nation. So how he would continue with that? The first thing which he has done during that time to train people he, in fact, invited all of them to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Holy Quran. Maybe you will ask, was Quran, reading Quran forbidden during the time of Muawiyah or during the time of Yazid? Yes, during the time of Yazid, you are aware that there was disgrace to Quran, dis disrespect to Kaaba, disrespect to the Masjid al-Nabi, but during the time of his father, People used to read Quran, but at the same time, be aware of that. Emphasis was put on the reading of Quran, not the understanding of Quran. So not necessarily if your mother tongue is Arabic and you can read Quran, you can understand Quran as well. If it was the case, Holy Prophet would have not said, إِنِّي تَارِكٌ فِيكُمُ كِتَابَ اللَّهُ that you have to stick with both. So Muawiyah would stop people from going and asking the tafsir. So there are verses of Quran, one after other, one after another, which are talking about the fadail of Ahlul Bayt. For instance, people, they would come and ask imams that there is a verse in Quran, Ulaikahum khairul bariya. Who are these people? So the people or the scholars who are paid by the government, they would say, these are the good people who pray. No. Imam says, Ulaika hum khairul bariya are the people who are on the vilayat of Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu salam salawat. <laughs> or the verse of Quran, wa amma bi ni'mati rabbika fahadith, that there is a ni'mat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which will be questioned. People they would read, oh, this is talking about the ordinary ni'mah. But when they would come to Imam, Imam would explain to them what ni'mah it, it is. And he would put other verses of Quran in comparison or to explain the verse of Quran. For instance, Al Yawm Akmaltu Lakum Deenakum wa Atmamtu Alaikum Ni'mati. So if you see this ni'mah, with that ni'mah, wa amma bi ni'mati rabbika fahaddis, very clearly you will draw the conclusion that on the day of Ghadir, by announcing the imamat of Amirul Mu'mineen, by vilayat of Amirul Mu'mineen, Allah is saying today, I have fulfilled, I have given all of my ni'mah to you, and on the day of judgment, I will ask you about this ni'mah. So this is the ni'mah of vilayat. So when people, they would go to these scholars and they would ask, what is that ni'mah? In fact, I have previously mentioned this point, but I would like to repeat that. People, they would go and ask the scholars of Banu Umayyah's dynasty, what is this ni'mah? And they would say, this is the ni'mah of eating and drinking and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given. I have explained this well, but I will just give you the reference of that. Imam would say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than that. We do not ask people, when we feed them after giving this worldly desires, Allah will ask us for the important, the most important ni'mah, which he says that today after the announcement of Amir al muminins vilayat, I have completed upon you. So Sayyid al-Sajjad, what was his first work? He used to sit in a corner because he was not allowed 
to read Quran in front of people. So he would go and sit in a corner and would read Quran out loud. This is Sunnah of Imam as well. In fact, yesterday in Friday sermon, I have requested and I have emphasized a lot on this point, brothers and sisters. Unfortunately, we have left Quran, we have deserted Quran on one side. There is no role of Quran in our life if we see practically in our lives. How much role Quran plays in our day-to-day -day life? How many times we read that? Or if we read, how many times we try to ponder upon the reading? We don't. It's a fact. But our fourth holy Imam, Imam Zainul Abidin, he is encouraging us that not only read the Quran, but ponder upon the meanings of Quran. So we being follower of Ahlul Bayt, especially being follower of fourth Imam, we have to connect ourselves strong with Quran. Because aspect of Ahlul Bayt cannot be stronger until we strong our connection with Quran as well. So he would recite Quran, he would encourage people to come and ask about Quran. So he would explain. So this was the first thing which he has done. Second thing, during the time of house arrest, because it was impossible for, for the caliphs to stop someone from reading Quran. So this was the first strategy of Imam, that he would read Quran out loud. They would have house arrested him, they would have asked him not to deliver a single word, but he was reading Quran. But the way he used to read Quran, because you will see when you understand Quran and you read that, there is a different kind of reading when you read without understanding. And that's why people, they will be attracted. So this is the miracle of Quran as well. We know during the time of Holy Prophet when people, they would abuse him, they would curse him, they would use to be disrespectful to him, but at the same time would come around his house and listen to the Tilawat of Quran. How many times Abu Jahl was caught by other mushrikeen? That what are you doing here? And he would ask, what are you doing here? Both of them, they were there to listen to Quranic verses. So this is the miracle of Quran, brothers and sisters. We have to be connected with Quran in our day-to-day -day life. Reading, pondering, understanding, practicing, all these four aspects in regard to Quran we see in the life of our fourth holy imam. So second aspect which we see very evident during the time of Imam Sayyid al-Sajjad, and that is due to some kind of change of the government. When there were some uprisings after the tragedy of Karbala, when people, they realized that what kind of mistake they have done. And here I would also like to mention very unique find out, finding of Shahid Bakr al-Sadr has written an article, he did some research, and he has analyzed in that article the people of Kufa, or people of Iraq in general, and people of Sham in general. So one point which he has mentioned in his article, that during the time of Karbala, during the time of tragedy of Karbala, people were of Iraq were different than people of Sham. People of Sham were unaware of the status of Amir al Mu'mineen, unaware of the status of Sayyida Fatima Tuzara. Maybe they knew that she is the daughter of Holy Prophet. But the relation of Sayyida Fatima Tuzara with Amir al Mu'mineen or through Ahlul Bayt, they were kept unaware of. For a long time, the ruler of Sham Muawiyah, for close to 40 years, he spent money to propagate against Amir al Mu'mineen. He would hire people to make the kids scared of Amir al Mu'mineen. He would hire people to conceal the fadail or the attributes of Amir al Mu'mineen. So, people of Sham, they were completely unaware. They were kept in dark about Ahlul Bayt. To the extent you might have heard that when Amir al Mu'mineen got martyred in Masjid and the news reached to Sham, people they would ask, Ali is killed in Masjid? How come Ali went to Masjid? Ali is not a Muslim. To this extent, people of Sham or Damascus were unaware about the truth. So much propaganda. And this is another very good lesson for this day and age. When propaganda is at its peak, internet, social media, Facebook, 
Twitter and other things. These are blessings. But we have to be very careful from which source we are getting information. We have to be very careful. Source should be authentic. So Yazid would make the ahadith fabricate, would pay to people to make a hadith for him or for Banu Umayyah and remove the hadith of Ahlul Bayt. So people they would take from them. But people of Sha people of Iraq. So this was about the people of Sham, Damascus. What about the people of Iraq? He says, people of Iraq, they knew the status of Amir al Mu'mineen because Amir al Mu'mineen used to live in Kufa. His house was there, his capital was there. So people of Kufa, they used to love a lot Ahlul Bayt. People of Iraq in general, they used to love Ahlul Bayt a lot, but there was one problem. That problem was they were not having strong will, strong willpower. So when they learned about Imam, Imam Sayyid al-Shuhada is coming, they wrote the letters, but some of them, they, they were not strong enough to leave their houses. We know, like people like Habib ibn Mughahir, he's from Kufa, Muslim ibn Ausaja. We don't have example like of these people. When Habib ibn Mughahir, he received the letter from Sayyid al-Shuhada, that son of Fatima al Zahra is on the plains of Karbala, and Habib, he needs your help. He reads the letter, kisses, puts his own forehead, and his wife asks, what was written in that letter? And he told his wife, yes, my master is on the plains of Karbala, and he is asking for help. And his wife says, Habib, what is your decision? He says, I am thinking. As soon as he says, I am thinking, his wife says, let me take my veil on and let me go to help Sayyid al-Shuhada, Habib, if you are thinking. So there were people like Habib, his wife. There were people like Muslim ibn Ausaja, who was in the street of Kufa, buying something, Hana. It is mentioned in the history that he used to, he was buying Mehdi or Hana. He, he was buying, and Habib ibn Mawahir is going towards Karbala. He sees Muslim ibn Ausaja, and he says, where are you going? And he says, I have received this letter from Imam. He throws, drops that hana in the market and would say, now my beard will be colored not with hana, with my blood. So there were, there were some people who were strong enough, but majority of them, people living around those countries, even some of the Bani Asad, some of the people, other, who came to help Imam afterwards, who realized, and that's why we see the whole movement of the Wabin. People, they repented. So Shaheed Baqar al-Sadr analyzed that people of Iraq, they used to know the status of Ahlul Bayt, but their will was not strong. Their willpower was not strong enough for them to go and help Imam. So Sayyid, uh, Sayyid al-Sajjad, he realized this situation. He worked on both grounds. Number one, when he arrived in Damascus, if you see and read his sermon last year, I explained some of them, so I'm not going to repeat that, but I'm mentioning a few points. When he arrives in Damascus, in the court of Yazid, in the situation when his legs are in chain, his hands are in chain, there is a big chain in his neck which is having thong, which are spearing in his neck. But at the same time, and hundreds of people are sitting, and he is being humiliated, but he delivers such a beautiful sermon in that court, by introducing himself. So he begins with Holy Prophet. He says, Anabnu Makkata wa Mina. So he brings the sacred places even that you are Muslims. Maybe you don't know Ahlul Bayt who are, but you respect Makkah. You respect Mina. I am the son of Makkah. I am the son of Mina. I am the son of Ja'far. I am the son of Aqil. I am the son of Abu Talib. I am the son of Holy Prophet. I am the son of Fatima to Zahra. One by one, one by one. One by one, he so eloquently, he explained his status that people who were not aware, they would cry. There was a revolution in the, in the court of Yazid. And at that time, he asked, go someone to pulpit and say, Allahu Akbar, do adhan. And how beautifully he got benefit of that situation as well. You are aware of that. But my point is, when he arrives in Medina, now he knows that he has to make people's willpower stronger. How? Number one, he did 
communicated, he did communicate with them with Quran. Second, with a hadith. So purposely, when he used to narrate the hadith from Holy Prophet, he would say, I have heard this from my father Hussein, who has heard it from his father Ali ibn Abi Talib, who has heard it from Rasulullah. So he delivered that. Number three, he also established a madrasa. When there was the change of the government, he got benefit of that time. He developed, actually he built the foundation of a madrasa or a school which became the university during the time of fifth and sixth imam. So the students which we see during the time of sixth holy imam, Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq alayhi salatu salam. So this madrasa's foundation was laid by fourth holy imam. That he used to invite people, he used to collect them, he used to deliver the lectures on all topics. Another beautiful thing which he did and was pointed out by Brother Adnan as well, so I will very quickly refer to that and the reason why I am repeating that because it is required by every single one of us including myself by living in this country. What did he do? One of the things which he has done and was so strong in the society and had the greatest impact, he did social work. He used to carry the bags on his own shoulders he used to carry the bags on his own back and would deliver the food to the orphans, to the widows, to helpless people, to destitute people, to poor people. He himself, he would deliver. They would wait for him. Kids, they would say, now he is coming who will feed us. They wouldn't know who is he. He never introduced himself. So this is the point. Sometimes maybe in our lifetime we are not given reward or acknowledgement of the work which we are doing, but it will have strong impact on the society as well as for our hereafter. So Imam Sayyid al-Sajjad would go and deliver the food. There were close to 400 families after the tragedy of Hara, he used to take care of them. Even sometimes the people of his enemy, and this is the testification in the history quoted by the women of the people of his enemy, in fact, in a fight, that under Sayyidu Sajideen, the care which we were provided, the respect which we were provided, we were not given that respect in our own homes. This was the level of kindness. This was the level of social work and helping poor destitute in the society. Regardless of faith, he used to help his own enemies. So brothers and sisters living in this society, our Imam is telling us how you can attract the hearts of your friends as well as your enemies by giving them favors. Not to make yourself acknowledge, no, but to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it is an obligation. So this was the work which Imam used to done. So reading Quran, teaching them Quran, connecting them with the true message of Quran, Delivering a hadith, establishing madrasa, social work, and one last thing which I would mention in these five things, and inshallah, I will finish my talk this night, the work of the du'as. What was so significant in du'as taught by Sayyidu Sajidin? If we see, the holy book of Quran talks about du'as. But the du'as which we see through Sayyidu Sajidin, and I was surprised and amazed. If you see, if you Google right now the book of du'as by Sayyidu Sajideen and the words of non-Muslims in regard to that book, Christians and other followers of other people, they would come and they would read these du'as and would become closer to God, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The way he has taught us how to supplicate, he told us, that dua is not only your need or to require your hajat or your necessity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dua is not only to worship 
But dua is to get connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One day, experiment this. Read dua without any purpose of asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any dua of Sahifa Sajadiyah. So some of his duas are compiled in a book which is called as Sahifatul Sajadiyah or as Sahifatul Kamila. This beautiful book. Every single dua is beautiful and unique, especially dua makarimul akhla. If you read, it will change your whole life. And read that one day without thinking that you are looking for a need. Yes, you have to read duas for your needs as well, but just for ma'rifah. And how we can neglect his manajat shabaniya how we can neglect his other du'as, one after the du'as of the days, the du'a, du'a, the supplication of Friday, the supplication of Saturday, you open the book of Mafatih, du'as narrated by Sayyidu Sajideen, you will see it gives you a strong healing and a strong connection with your creator. So this was the way Imam والسلام, made people's will stronger. So people, they, they would not see that he is just delivering us a lecture. No. They would read the dua he used to teach them. And they would feel stronger to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For instance, one of the ziyarat in dua and ziyarat which we have from Sayyidu Sajideen, ziyarat aminullah. Not only he used to teach people how to develop and establish their connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he will teach them the status of Ahlul Bayt as well. So I would like to read few verses from Ziyarat Aminullah, which is one of the very famous Ziyarat. And in fact, it is recommended that whenever you go to the shrine of any Ma'asum, any Imam, initially it was for Amirul Mu'mineen, but if you go to any shrine, read the Ziyarat Aminullah. But change the word, Assalamu Alaikum Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, with the name of that Imam. I would like to read some of the phrases of this dua, Sallu Ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So maybe once in a week you read this dua and see how beautifully Imam has explained the personality of Imam. And then at the same time in one or few phrases, he is teaching us how to communicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, Assalamu alaikum ya ameen Allah fi ardi. Begins with the words, peace be upon you, O trustees. Ameen Allahi fi ardi. O trustees of Allah on his lands. He's saying that this land, everything, al-aradin was samawat. This belongs to Allah. No one can. Yusabbihu lillahi ma fi samawat wa ma fi al-ard. Al-malik al-quddus al-aziz al-hakim. Everything praises him because he is the malik. No one is there. But Imam says, no, he has made some trustees, the trustworthies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, if you want to see trustee of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your land, come to Imam. Assalamu alayka ya amir al mu'mineen. Ashhadu annaka, I bear witness, annaka jahatta fillahi haqqa jihadih. I bear witness that you strove for the sake of Allah as it ought to be striven. The haqq of jihad. And you follow the footstep of Holy Prophet. Until you were asked by him to return back. And then he explains the role of an Imam after being trustee of Allah on the face of earth. He is saying, that if there is any proof, any hujjat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is upon the people, jami'i khalqi, not only on Shias, not only on Muslims, but everybody, jami'i khalqi, that includes the birds, the animals, the elephants, the, the trees and the skies and the... Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He explains the role of an uh, role of uh, an imam who is mansus min Allah appointed by Allah subhanahu wa taala. After that, he teaches us a dua. One phrase 
and I would say, this phrase encompasses all of our du'as. None of the du'as is excluded, excluded from this. Allahumma, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, faj'al nafsi mutma'innatan biqadarik. O oh Allah, make myself, make my soul satisfied with your decree, which can be excluded than that. If I am rich, oh Allah, it's your kindness. It's not my degree. It's not my wealth. It's not my business. You have decreed for me to be a rich. But if I am a poor, I have no complaint because it was your decision for me. Allahumma faj'al nafsi mutma'innatan biqadari. Whatever you have decreed, whatever you have decided for me, if you decided for me to be sick, Alhamdulillah. Oh Allah, make me satisfied on that. If you have given me the health, Allahumma faj'al nafsi mutma'innatan biqadari. In all situation, in richness, in poverty, in health, in disease, in sickness, in any problem, in any, any kind of atrocity, oh Allah, make me satisfied with your decision. I believe none of the du'as can be excluded with that. Usually our prayers are, oh Allah, give me health, oh Allah, give me house, oh Allah, give me wealth, oh Allah, give me good job, oh Allah, give me good wife, oh Allah, good, give me good status, oh Allah, give me good position, give me good car, give me good, good computer, phone, one, two, three, countless. Oh Allah, what you have given me, keep me satisfied on that. Contentment. One phrase and all du'as are there. So this is the way Sayyidu Sajideen has taught. So this is from countless du'as, one phrase I have recited. You can imagine the depth of Sayyidu Sajideen's du'a. Read it, brothers and sisters. It will change your life. It will change definitely a guarantee. If you read with insight, with conviction, it will change your life. You will be satisfied. Oh Allah, I pray to you because ana faqirun ilayk. I have nothing. I have I have come to you with empty hand. Nothing. What I have brought? My sins. Why I have come? Because I know you are Rabbul Arbab. You are Akramul Akrameen. You are not like us. You are not like us people that we punish each other. No. If I have come with nothing, you will accept me. If I have come to you with sins, you will welcome me. If I have taken one step, you will come 70 steps towards me. So this is your promise. Ya man rahmat, ya man sabaqat rahmatuhu ghadabah. Or the one whose blessing, favor, benevolence comes before his anger and wrath. Who can be in this world? Amirul Mu'mineen is teaching us, when you call upon your Lord, when you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, he is al-qahar. He he is just. But tell him, oh Allah, the aspect which we know from you is your mercy. That your mercy comes before your wrath, before your punishment. If we go towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this faith, definitely he will, he will shower his mercy upon us. But provided that our actions are not contradicting our language, our, our words. So if we are calling upon him, oh Allah, I have faith in you and I'm coming towards you, my actions should show that I'm coming towards you. I have not associated myself with this world. I have associated myself towards you, with you. So we see this in the life of Sayyidu Sajjad. Even to the extent when he saw the head of his father on spear, what was his reaction? It's not easy, brothers and sisters, to see the head of his own father, not ordinary father, a father who used to ride on the back of Rasulullah, the father who used to be kissed by Rasulullah. But when he sees the head of his father, he does not lose his control. 
Assalamu alayka ya abad. At the same moment, he gives his salutations. And it is said, when Sayyidu Shuhada came to bid farewell with his son Sayyidu Sajidin, understand and have the value of being connected to this personality who is teaching us how to be thankful in all situations, how to be having faith and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the worst scenarios in your life. Assalamu alaikum ya abad. When Sayyidu Shuhada on the day of Ashura went to bid farewell with his sister, he said, Brother Hussein, have you decided? And he said, yes, my sister, it is decree of Allah to sacrifice myself to uphold the values of Islam. She says, brother, go and bid farewell with your son. Enters in the tent of his young son looks towards him. Sayyid Sajjad is in the state of unconsciousness. Sayyid Zainab shakes the body. Son, son Sayyid Sajjad, open your eyes. Your father is here to bid farewell with you. Opens the eye. Sees his father smeared in the blood throughout his body from head to toe, smeared in blood, and blood is coming out of the clothes. The whole body is having wounds. Look towards father and says, Who are you? Says, O son, Sayyid Sajjad, O son Ali, have you not recognized your father? In bewilderedness, as Oh, Father, what happened to you? Oh, son Ali, since morning until now, carrying the dead bodies. Oh, Father. The first question he asked, Oh, Father, where is my uncle Abbas? Qad Qutil. He had faith that until my uncle Abbas is alive, no one can touch my father. One by one, ask, where is Habib Qad Qutil? Where is Muslim Ibn Ausija Qad Qutil? Until reaches to his last question. Aina, Aina Ali and Al Akbar, oh my father, where is my brother Ali Akbar? Hussein wouldn't answer anything. He knows how can the pain of losing a brother just few moments back when his own brother Abbas fell from the saddle of the horse on the plains of Karbala. Hussein called upon Abbas Al-An in Kasar Zahri. My brother Abbas, my back is broken. He knows the pain of losing a brother so cannot tell Ali ibn al Hussein that your brother Ali ibn al Akbar is martyred so he says oh my son oh my son Sajjad <laughs> listen now you and I are the only male left says at Zainab bring me a stick and a sword she would ask Son Sajjad, why you wish of the sword and the stick? And Zainab, have you not heard? My father is all alone. I would go to the battlefield and would help my father. Hussein, who is left alone, who is deserted on the plains of Karbala. Son Sajjad, you cannot go. <laughs> Through you, Allah will hold his imamat, his messengership. Bits farewell with father. 
and the time come when one more time a call in Karbala is sounded. Verily, Hussein is slaughtered on the plains of Karbala. Zainab Sheikh, so oh, Ali ibn al Hussein, oh my son, wake up. Your father has been killed, looks towards the door of the tent, sees the father's head on the spear. Say Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. And the time comes when the horses tramples on the body of Hussein. Azurukum al Allah. And the time comes the night of the atrocities, which is famous with Shah Gariba. Sayyidah Zainab comes. O son, Sayyidah Sajjad, enemy has burnt our tents. There is fire all around. What is the ruling? If we stay inside the tents, we might burn ourselves and kill ourselves. If we go outside, we have no veil to cover our head. What is the ruling? I would say our peace and salutations be upon you, O Imam. What is the first ruling you have to deliver? Says, O oh, Ant, take everybody outside. Saving life is wajib and mandatory. Comes outside. A historian says, I was seeing tents are burning. And I would see a tall woman hastens towards a tent goes inside and comes outside. Again goes inside and when she sees the flames comes outside. I got curious. I went to the lady and I asked, is there something very precious you have left in the tent? Why you go inside and then due to the flames of tent you come outside? Says, oh man, yes, there is a very precious thing left in the tent. Our Imam, my nephew, Ali ibn al Hussein, is the tent. Goes inside, comes outside carrying a man on her shoulder. Ali ibn al Hussein, I would say, our peace and salutations be upon you, our Imam. How you would have handled that situation. And this is the reason, brothers and sisters. When in Medina, he used to be asked, what was the most difficult part during the atrocity of Karbala? He would not tell that the difficult part was when my brother Ali and Al Akbar was attacked with spear, or my uncle Abbas was severed his hands by the plains of Euphrates, or my father was sacrificed. He would say, Asham, 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 the most difficult part of my life was the streets of Sham when we were dragged in our hands, there were chains, and our women without covering and veils, and boiling water was thrown upon our heads, and I was put a big yoke in my neck, having thongs would spear in my <laughs> neck and my head. Ajrukum Allah. It is said when Imam Sayyidus Sajjad used to walk in the streets of Medina, the butchers, the market of the butchers, whenever he used to step in, they would call upon people, cover your animals, cover your animals, Sayyidus Sajjad is coming. Why they used to cover their animal? Because they knew that Sayyidus Sajjad will come and they would ask, and he would ask, O oh butcher, you have killed this sheep. And I would answer, yes, I have killed this sheep. Have you offered water to this sheep before slaughtering? And when they would say, yes, we have offered the water because we are the followers of your grandfather, Rasulullah, he would look towards Karbala, would say, oh, my father, Hussein, my peace and salutations be upon you. You were slaughtered without offering a water. 
brothers and sisters, the time comes when Sayyid Sajjad was poisoned. Throughout his life, he would remember the atrocity of his father. He would tell people about the tragedy of Karbala. He would mention to people to remember Hussein. But when the time comes, he is on, he is on his own deathbed. And his son, Muhammad Baqir, he comes, puts his head on the chest of his own father, Ali ibn al-Hussein. Even that moment, when he is departing from this world, says to his son, O oh Muhammad, how fortunate you are that your father is departing from this world and you are giving comfort to your father. But my peace and salutations be on my father Hussein. When Shimr was sitting on the chest of my father Hussein and used to kill and used to attack and stab with blunt dagger on the neck of my father Hussein. <laughs> وَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيَّ مُنْقَلَبٍ يَنْقَلِبُونَ إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ ماتم حسين يا 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 حسين